Good uh, morning, I guess, here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is on the slides. You can call me Slava, because probably most of you can't pronounce it anyway. Uh, and I'm here today to speak about my experience, or our experience, uh, if I speak about myself and the team, uh, building the optimizing compiler for Dart. So, uh, and of course, I will be also talking a little bit about V8, because a lot of us Dart people come from the V8 team originally. And we are all standing on the shoulders of giants who did a small talk and self and so on. But I will not be talking about that because I was too small and was not allowed to participate. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what we uh, were trying to do with uh, Dart is basically to repeat the V8's success in making JavaScript uh, fast language. And so we also wanted to make a fast uh, virtual machine for Dart. And uh, if you take uh, some measure of the success, then it probably would be a V8 benchmark SU score, which I drew on this slide. And the most interesting part of that uh, curve is uh, in the middle where there is a big jump. That's uh, when the crankshaft, which is a adaptive compilation pipeline for JavaScript for V8 was introduced. And uh, the evolution of the performance did not stop there. It's just that the V8 benchmark suit stopped to exist there and became an octane. So I don't have a, a way to continue this curve to the present. But it's still going up and up and up to the clouds. So uh, the start of this curve might seem uninspiring, but actually when V8 was released, it showed on the V8 benchmark suit 10 or 20x speed up compared to the existing uh, naive VMs of that time. Uh, so it's a good start. So what's actually the problem with uh, optimizing dynamic languages like JavaScript or Dart? Because Dart is also a dynamically typed language. So the problem is, is very simple actually. The programmer writes something that looks very simple, but uh, machine wants to execute something that looks very complicated. And uh, the runtime system has to walk a long and complicated path to get there. So, uh, and the reason why this path is so complicated is very simple, because the runtime system does not know where it's going. Like, there is a property, where is this property? Go there, go there, go there, walk, 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 panic, arrive. And the idea that you immediately can see is once you arrive to the destination and know where it is, Maybe next time you can take a shortcut and go directly there. It's a very simple idea, but it actually underlines everything that the people optimizing dynamic languages do. And so I like to say that the optimizing compilation is the art of finding these shortcuts and taking them. Uh, well, there are all the problems that you have with dynamically typed languages is they can be divided into three categories. One is the problem of finding the most efficient representation for your values uh, or objects that will be memory efficient and also execution efficient so that you can quickly perform operations with it. There is a problem of resolution because everything is laid bound. So you need to find a way to quickly resolve, at least on the second try, uh, properties, methods, and so on. And uh, there is a problem of redundancy. If you resolved the same thing twice, can you reuse the resolution that you did first time. I will be mostly talking about the last two things because that's what the optimizing compiler deals with. Uh, the problem of representation is a problem that you have to solve when you design your runtime system. Okay, so I will be mostly talking about property accesses because that's what the programs do, the access properties. And uh, in the program it looks like this very small dot, but it's actually a very fat operation. Eh? Because it has to solve or answer two questions. It has to look at the object and understand what kind of object is there. And then it has to find the property on this object and understand where the property is located and then load this property or execute a method and so on. It's all property access essentially. So here you might say, okay, we want to take a shortcut. So once we did it once, 
can we just catch the relation between the what and where? And the answer is yes, you can cache. That's called inline caching. That's what small talk people came up with a long time ago. And that's what majority of the VMs, I would say, that are used in production now are using. Uh, like even the Java VM, which is not operating with a dynamic language, is still using inline caching to speed up the calls through the interfaces, for example, because interface resolution, the re resolution of the interface methods is roughly a dynamic late binding. Uh, okay. So, but for JavaScript, there is uh, another issue here, is that the objects, they have no shape. So you cannot easily cache the relation between the shape of the object and the place of the property, because the objects are just these clouds of evaporated property, properties, basically. And, uh, and uh, you need to find a way to see the shape behind this cloud. And uh, the approach that you can be using here is, uh, brilliant and simple. You just observe the evolution of the object that is, as it's been built, basically. You start with an empty object, and then when you add the property x to it, you have an object with a property x, and if you add another property, you have an object with x and y. If you add a third property, it's, it's, it's a different shape. And uh, because there should be a many functional programmers here, uh, I have a good way to explain it to you. Instead of using the mutable dictionary, you split it into two parts. You take the immutable structure that describes which properties you have or which keys you have in your dictionary, and you have the mutable structure that actually stores the values. And then you connect all the immutable structures like an empty structure, a structure with x, a structure with x and y, a structure with x, that, with the transitions. Like from an empty one, if you add a property x, you get to a structure which contains x. If you add y to that, you get to a structure x, y. That's why uh, this way you have a sharing of the shapes between dictionaries that contain values. And so you can use it to quickly understand uh, what kind of shape your shapeless cloud actually has. Okay, but you can actually generalize that past the simple idea. For example, if you add a function to, the, to your object, uh, you can actually think that it's a method being added to the class so you can promote this from the value stored on the object to the value to a method stored on the class itself. To, and that will allow you to speed up method calls uh, or inline them. You can track the types of elements in the arrays and represent these arrays in the most efficient way possible. You can even track, type, track types of fields. Like for example, the X can contain uh, only doubles or X and Y both contain only doubles and so on. And as you can see, it's a very powerful technique, but it's also very complex, and it affects everything that you have in your VM and you have to design from ground up. Uh, for example, if you are trying to concatenate several arrays, your runtime system that performs actual concatenation should not try to add elements one by one to the resulting array, but instead, from the start, derive the most efficient representation for the backend store of their array first, and then copy the elements. So it's really pervasive. Fortunately, Dart does not need that. Well, at least does not need the whole thing because uh, Dart objects are not shapeless clouds. So when we started working on Dart, that was the decision from the start that we don't want these hundreds, thousands, well, thousands lines of code in the VM that try just to derive the uh, information about the structure of the object that the programmer could provide. And it's both beneficial for the VM and for the programmer because he can see the structure of the code and have the methods and so on. Okay, so all I told you before is useless. Oh, no, not useful at least. Uh, oh, can be useful, but not useful immediately. Okay, it doesn't matter. So, let's return to this fat black dot. So how do you organize inline caches, caches in the VM, in Dart VM? Oh, very simple actually. You just take this fat dot and attach a small cache to it a table basically with two fields, one that contains the receiver that the fed dot observed or the property lookup observed, and uh, it maps it to the method that you actually need to execute to get the property. Because the Dart, it just, it has getters and setters for properties, and loading normal properties can be also expressed as executing getter and setter, 
just with a fixed offset in memory and so on. And uh, it's actually very simple. If the table is empty, you go to runtime to populate it with the current, or if the, the none of the cache entries match, you just go to runtime and populate this table. Okay. In V8, it's actually different. And I was also looking for a way to express it in a good way, and I found it. So the inline caches in uh, V8, they look like pig noses. So, well, because I'm in the US, apparently nobody recognizes what this is. It actually looks like this in, uh, in US. So that's a power outlet. In Europe, it looks like that reminder. So the uh, stuff, uh, you generate these outlets in your code, and then you can plug different stuff into these outlets. So the plug contains the fast pass, so it can check some assumptions like, I see two integers, then I can quickly add them and return. If it can't handle, it just goes to the runtime. And the runtime can handle everything, the mighty runtime. So here is a little bit of assembly code. I really wanted to put some assembly code. That's the only slide with assembly code. So, uh, so the, the power outlet itself is just a call that, uh, like call instruction with the address to call. And this address can be changed. You basically just patch this code as you, as you go to plug different things into this outlet. Uh, and the things you plug is the small snippets of machine code that check an assumption. Like here it compares the hidden class to some hidden class. If it is not equal, the expectation is wrong, then you go to runtime to handle this. Otherwise, you just load the property from a fixed offset in the object and you return. Simple. Okay. And you can have many different power outlets, as I said. But sooner or later, you arrive to the problem because uh, the, if the only thing that you have is an inline cache, then everything looks as an inline cache stuff. And uh, if you have this simple system full of IC and you want to specialize something, you just say, okay, I will just handwrite an assembly uh, stuff for that and do that. And you end up with a special stuff for concatenating strings, special stuff for pushing stuff into arrays and so on and so forth. Computing dates, I don't know, whatever you want. And this is a problem because you can write all them by hand and so on and so forth. Very boring and error prone. And it doesn't actually solve uh, another problem. So here you can do two observations. So inline caches in V8, they really were originally the stuff that came, like the only thing that V8 had when it was released were inline caches essentially to optimize the code. And uh, they were really designed to provide as little overhead as possible. Once you connect outlet and the stop, there is only overhead of the call, and that's it basically, and some checks. And in DartVM, they are very slow. If you look, there is a table, there is basically, it does a linear search inside the table, not even like binary search or hash table. Uh, and that's because the DartVM from the start was using the inline caches only to provide type feedback, while V8 was using inline caches to provide performance. And what is this type feedback I'm talking about here? I will tell you a little bit later. Uh, but uh, the important word on this slide is locally. Uh, each inline cache acts independently from each other inline cache. So they don't exchange information. So you can end up with two inline caches checking the same stuff right one after another. And that's a problem. So that's how the compilation pipeline of the V8 looked like back in the day. You just take the source, you get AST from that, then you put it into compiler, and the compiler puts a lot of ICs into that and in one pass emits the native code, done. Now the inline caches, they do uh, the magic and speed up the execution and you do quick Node.js, I don't know, whatever. So, uh, and as I said, the inline caches, they, uh, they improve performance only locally. So how to solve this issue with only local improvements? Well, if one compiler is not enough, you add another compiler to the picture and uh, the problem solves itself. Uh, this compiler is more sophisticated. It has internal representations, it has optimizations that look like <laughs> and it has another internal representation, then it emits native code. Here you can ask me, wait a second, why we could not have it from the get-go? Just Well, the reason is we don't have information to produce the type specialized IRs for the compiler to do the good optimizations. But if we first compile with one compiler which uses ICs and then allow it to run, then we can take the state of the ICs 
which observed all these values and so on, and feed it into the, our complicated compiler as a type feedback. And then using this type feedback, the information about observed types, we can produce a type specialized IR and then do <laughs> optimizations and emit native code, which is high quality and with a lot of local redundancies removed. And that's what crankshaft was and this whole bump that we want to quickly repeat in the Dart VM. This is the, the reason behind that bump. Okay. So, uh, but you can also spot a couple of issues here. Uh, the issue number one is that uh, you have one compiler that generates code in one pass from the AST and then you have the compiler that starts with a building IR and doing optimizations on that. And you need to keep them in sync the building of IR and the one pass compiler because you also want to switch from optimized code to unoptimized and back. And the other reason is that, uh, the other problem here is that uh, type feedback that you try to get from the ICs, you get in a really spooky way because the inline caches were for the peak performance, they have the type information only in the generated assembly code. So you have to pattern match the generated assembly code uh, to get the type feedback out. And that's really spooky. If you pattern match the wrong thing, then you get very strange uh, code out of that. It usually works, but sometimes it's a strange performance. Okay, so Dart VM we designed a little bit differently. You start with a source, you get AST, okay, everybody's sleeping, it's boring part. Then you produce one IR for everything, for both for optimizing and non-optimizing compilation. And uh, the only difference is that you perform optimizations or not perform optimizations. So there is a single IR, single backend for code generation, and there are additional optimization passes that you apply once you gathered enough type information. And another difference is that uh, V8 did not have a truly polymorphic ICs from the beginning. Now it gets more and more of them. Soon every IC will be truly polymorphic. But the Dart VM has a truly polymorphic ICs because they they're just tables. They collect all the types that they see. Okay. So now let's talk about optimizations, this thing that uh, both compilers do. But I will be mostly talking about Dart VM. So it has a couple of optimizations. I put them all on the slide, this couple. Some of them are simple, some of them a little bit sophisticated, but just a tiny little bit. Not more complicated than baking a pie. So, okay, strange analogy, I don't know why I say that. Uh, Let's talk about them. So one thing we actually understood while doing both V8 and RTM is that uh, you don't usually need the sophisticated uh, optimizations that you read about in the papers because they are very generic. They can hit a lot of cases, but you actually want to hit just 80% and do it fast. So a lot of our optimizations are just a single pass over the dominator tree. The dominator tree is, uh, uh, is this structure you can find in the control flow graph that uh, tells you uh, if you go get to the block three, for example, you need to pass through the block one. Or if you get to the block four, you need to pass through block one and block three guaranteed. So you just do a single pass top down or bottom up or whatever, and then you can derive some useful information from the domination relation in the tree. Uh, here's an example from how we propagate types. You have a class check and the specialized load from a fixed offset from the field of that class. And somewhere down the graph, you have another block which was not type specialized for whatever reason. Maybe it was not executed, so the ICs did not deliver type information. So you just le left a call there, which is slow. But these blocks are connected with a domination relation. So you walk top down and propagate the type and you see that X is guaranteed to be A because it's checked in the block that dominates. So you can just replace this call with a load and there will be no check because the check is already done. Okay, simple. So it's a very simple but very powerful optimization which is very useful. Uh, it can do a lot of spe type specialization. I wrote it all on the slide but I don't think it's really necessary to tell here. But uh, one important part is that, for example, the Dart has production mode and the check mode. So Dart is this uh, a little bit strange language which uh, is kind of typed but kind of untyped and dynamically typed. So you can write typed annotations but they're completely uh, unused in the production mode. They're just like comments. But if you run in the checked 
mode, then they are checked, but they are checked in the runtime. So they are basically converted to assertions that some value is of certain type in a place where you, for example, assert to the variable that is typed as t. You check that the value that you store is t. So if you run in the checked mode, then you have the code full of these assertions, and you really need to do a good job propagating the types to eliminate these assertions to bring the performance penalty down. Okay. Uh, now, I just told you that the type annotations, they are neglected. So you can say, oh, wait a second, there is, uh, there is a problem here. You told us that the classes, they have a fixed shape. Okay, we can load from a fixed offset. But what we are loading from there, we don't know because the type annotation on the field means nothing in the production mode. So it's, you still have to check what you loaded when you want to do an operation on that. Yes, unfortunately you do. So we decided to do a local optimization there. So yes, you know what you're where you're loading from, but you don't know what you are loading. We decided to track types of the fields globally. So each field has associated type information which which you track in the runtime, which tells you, I don't know anything about type, or I know that the all fields in all objects of this type, well, this field in all objects of this type uh, that exist in the, in the heap contain a, special, a particular class. Or it can tell you that they contain different classes, I don't know which one. So it's a very simple three, uh, three element lattice for, well, not three, but okay, yeah. So, uh, and when you load stuff from this field, you assume that you loaded this particular class if you know which one. But when you store, you have to check. So that's what we use and it allows to eliminate a lot of the type checks on the values that you load. And when you store, you usually already know what kind of value you store. So uh, this guard can be eliminated with a type propagation pass, which I was telling you about before. Uh, it's, it's useful, okay. Yes. Uh, another optimization that we do is obviously the unboxing of the primitive values. So the doubles, they are floating in the heap box and the boxes. And uh, we also have SIMD values, which you can use the basically SIMD intrinsics to operate on to speed up your graphics or games or whatever. And you want to unbox them from these boxes that float in the heap and put them on the register, so on the stack in the optimized code. So it's very simple to do in Dart because uh, values are typed. Integer is a different type from double or SIMD. So we just uh, use inline caches to tell you this operation was performed on double, so this operation was performed on SIMD type. And then you unbox these variables or values. Uh, there is a problem with integers because integer is a non-fixed precision. It's uh, arbitrary width integer. So you need to range profile the, the values that you the operations, like if you added two integers, what kind of range did you get out? Uh, and which, uh, which operands did this operation see? So VM does not try to do that yet, but you really need it to perform, to perform well on the like 64-bit integer arithmetic, for example. Okay, so it works well for us uh, just using the type-based unboxing because uh, we have a split between double and int, unlike JavaScript, where you really have to do a range profiling to understand where you want to use doubles and when you want to specialize to ints because the JavaScript has only double type uh, in the language. And uh, we also use this mine coding just like the V8 uses. It's uh, shifted basically uh, with one tag, big, one tag bit at the least significant bit uh, tag representation. So, okay. Yes, as I said, you the JavaScript is a little bit more convoluted. It has uh, only double, but bitwise operations that can coerce this double to in32 or u in32 range, and uh, you really need to track what's happening in your code to understand how to emit the most efficient arithmetic. Okay. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about loads. So the programs are usually full of loads and stores. That's what they do. And uh, here is an example. You do a a load on one path that loads a field and you do a store in another path and then both of them flow into the place where you load again. And there is an obvious redundancy here. Like on one path you know that the value will be the same, like A, well if, if you know that nothing changes it. And on the other path you know that the, 
the value will be B because that's what we stored there. So what we do here is that we replace this uh, load with a phi function. The phi function is an artifact of an SSA representation which is equal to A on this path and e equal to B on this path. Uh, and the load is nowhere to be seen, so you can just keep these values in the register and then there will be no load. It's a very powerful optimization actually. And it's very useful. And it's useful especially to uh, eliminate the overheads of the object-oriented or high, uh, like high-level abstractions. Uh, for example, if you do an iteration over the list, you need an iterator to do this iteration. So this code looks for 2VM, something like that. It's a lot of code. There is an abstraction, you have to allocate iterator, you have to move it, and then you have to always ask it what's the current element. Uh, so what V8 uh, VM does is uh, it inlines these operations that were highlighted. So you have an allocation of the iterator and then you initialize the fields. You have like a list stored in the iterator, you have a current index, then you increment the index, check it against the lengths. That's the move next operation in line. And then you uh, just take load this uh, element from the list at this index. Okay, a lot of operations with the fields. And that's where the load forwarding kicks in. So uh, first, what it did is you can see it forwarded all the loads of it.list and there it just uses the list because it knows that nothing changes this field. It just can use the list, the original one. Then it also forwarded some of the operations with IDX, with index, and introduced the new like pentagram local variable that uh, stores the current iteration count essentially. And uh, it, when it loads from the list, it just uses this variable but uh, it still has to store it in the iterator every now and again. But it knows that it, these two, two things are in sync, like the field in the iterator and the local variable. So it can just use it when it loads from the list. It doesn't have to read from the iterator the current index. And what is left is just to remove the allocation of the iterator. That's a separate pass, it can just kill it. And now we are left with a local variable and no sign of iterator. So the, this code is basically as efficient as the normal loop success. Uh, the last step was not actually a load forwarding, but uh, something called allocation syncing, which removes the allocation from the optimized code and puts it on the uncommonly executed paths, like deoptimization, for example. Uh, I actually lied to you a little bit. So you need, two optimizations are not enough to fix this, uh, the structure of this loop because uh, the iterator looks something like that. It's a lot of code. So to produce a really efficient uh, result, you need to apply many things together. Like for example, there is a check which checks that length of the list does not change to help the programmers discover the concurrent modification issues. And uh, to eliminate this check, you need to do constant folding and so on. Or like it returns a Boolean, uh, but you really want to avoid materializing this Boolean on the stack or in the register and then check it whether it's true or false. So you have to, instead of the materializing the Boolean, you have to directly connect the control flow edges when you inline and so on. There are many passes that uh, have to work over this code to give you a efficient result that as, as, as efficient as a normal loop. Okay, and the same you can do with uh, a closure. You can completely eliminate the allocation of the closure, for example, and also have the uh, efficient loop. Okay, so uh, as you can see, there are some optimizations that are really important to eliminate the overhead of the abstractions. And the last thing that I really want to tell you about is that uh, all these optimizations, they are really highly dependent on the inlining, which is, I think, the hardest problem of the compiler construction, actually. So the problem with inlining is that to understand whether you will benefit from the inlining or not, you need to try. But at the same time, trying costs you. So if you have a compiler that has to produce the code relatively quickly, and it doesn't have all the time in the universe to think about it, you have a trouble. Because if you don't inline, for example, in the uh, previous example where uh, you need to inline a constructor to see that 
how the fields are changed or in line move next to see how they are changed when you move to the next element and so on. You can do no optimizations. You will be stuck with the iterator which costs you. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot try to inline everything and then undo what you tried if you see no benefit because you will spend incredible amount of time compiling. That's a problem with no clear solution. So you have to be really conservative. You use very brain dead heuristics. Well, some of them are not brain dead. Some of them are too brainy. Both does not work. Uh, yeah, as I said, the inline is the most important thing, kind of. Uh, so the solution is, uh, you have, well, at least the solution that we adopted for now is that the library is kind of whitelisted to force inlining of iterators and so on to force the elimination of the abstractions. And you use some spooky heuristics to uh, uh, help user code a little bit. But if it does not hit it, you have no way of fixing it because the language doesn't allow you to control the JIT compiler. No clear solution. That's the problem. Okay, and I think that would be it. Thank you very much for your attention.